Tickets on 351 to 379. It is due on Friday. I might add a few pages, but it's going to be due on Monday. So I'm going to give me a couple extra days. Sound good? Everyone got that? It's due on Monday. Next, this is the American system. I put this 1815. This is going to create what we are as a country. So the pre Industrial Revolution, pre-war of 1812 country, is not one that we would recognize. None of us could really survive it. It would be so different. Just the way they thought, the way their idea of money, the way their idea of work, everything was different. And also the idea of government, their idea of it all. That's one of the things about the Constitution. It's something that people forget. That was written before our system now. And it's going to be created afterwards. And so here's this idealized before that, here's going down the Ohio on the um, keel boat, and then the so-called settlers, they be the land of the people who live here, more settlers. Here's the Cincinnati on the Ohio. And by the end of 1840, this is only 25 years. You have the Industrial Revolution. You have uh, stone railway bridges that still last to this day. Massive factory powered by steam. Democracy. Oh, that's too much. At least our concept of it. Remember, the Constitution was written to be anti democratic. And then, of course, a lot of this is going to be represented by this turbulence by Andrew Jackson. And so, part of this all developed in this so called era of good feelings. And the reason we have to mention the era of good feelings is because it's so not an era of good feelings. It hid all the problems, but there was one political party. What party died during? after the War of 1812. Federalists. Federalists. Everybody's a Republican. But that means people who agreed with Federalist ideas, remember Hamilton, are now Republicans. And that's going to blow it up again into the Republicans will blow up into what's going to become the democracy or the Democratic Party and the Whigs. That's coming down the road. James Monroe is going to be elected for two terms. And Monroe, who is considered, yeah, kind of a mediocre person, not the sharpest tack, but he represented Virginia, another Virginia president, president who was Secretary of State. Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe were all Secretaries of State. That picture of him, I first saw that picture and I thought, God, it's George Washington. Doesn't it kind of look like him? But it's a little off, yeah, that's Monroe. They're both born in Fredericksburg, Virginia. If you get a chance, go to Fredericksburg. It's really cool. I recommend the Iron Brigade Cafe. Really good. Hmm? Yeah, gotta go to the Iron Brigade Cafe. That's a Civil War reference, of course. But 1816, he won a huge election, and you notice huge victory. The Federalists are just basically Massachusetts. The name was still part of Massachusetts then. Just here. In 1820, Monroe won all but one vote. And the only reason he wasn't unanimous is because they decided that that should only go to Washington. And so it seemed like the air of good feelings. Remember nationalism, we're all Americans, it's one party. It hit all of the problems underneath. Especially the fact that the so-called air of good feelings, the entire United States, and from there, the entire world is going to be turned upside down. Everything will be different. And starting here, a couple of things we have to get. During the Madison administration, two big laws we have to know would be passed. A, the Second National Bank. And remember, he opposed the Second National Bank, the beginning of political parties, as the Republican. Now he's signing the bill. And another one, he signed the first large tariff. What do you call a tariff that's meant to keep out foreign competition to help domestic industry? What is that called? Do you remember? I heard a couple of different words. What? Yes. Yeah, protective tariff. Put that up here. Protective right there. A protective tariff. The first one, he, Madison, opposed. Oh, that's Nicholas Biddle. He was the head of the bank. And I just like that picture. Remember I told you how they drew men and women and how they looked? He looks about 12. He was in his late 30s. Well, ironically, this is the Republican Party, but it shows there's only one party. What person wanted these two things? Who? Hamilton. 
Yeah, Hamilton. This is Hamilton. Is that what you said? Yeah. I oh, I'm sorry. I didn't scared. hear you. Read. No, no, no. You said Hamilton. I'm like, what? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Hamilton. This is the Federalist ticket, and now the Republicans are doing it. So it showed that you know, the whole party structures were getting turned upside down. I mean, you're going to see that with the, the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party will be all for the common man and working people. And then slavery will get in the way. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was, he was gone by then. A federalist. And another thing, this nationalist court, remember the nationalist court, I mentioned this before, the Marshall Court. In this context, na context nationalism means for the central government. A series of court cases that we'll have to know on Tuesday, AKA the round of quiz, gotta know these court cases, very basic. I'll, I'll explain them. These quiz, the, I'll be a matching on the five court cases. You have to know them. You have to know the five court cases. Be really basic what you need to know, really basic. Marbury versus Madison, we already know that. What do we call when it can check the constitutionality of laws? What is that called? Judicial review. Yeah, judicial review. They gave themselves that power. And this is kind of, this is from an old textbook going through it. I just thought it was kind of amusing. I love the old graphics from the 1960s textbooks. But then another court case, Fletcher versus Peck. And this was about an issue in Mississippi Territory, Georgia, called the Yazoo Land Deal. But what it said was there could be judicial review for state laws, too, if they violate the Constitution. But I put question marks there because most people did not acknowledge that. So they said that, but for the most part, people did not follow the precedent of Fletcher versus Peck until after the Civil War, until after. So this is the first one. So we have, we already have Marbury versus Madison, now judicial review for state laws. Today, this is accepted for the most part, but it's still a gray area, remember the 10th Amendment. Next, Dartmouth versus Woodward. Nine years later, this is about Dartmouth University, a, a contract. But the, the actual decision here is not that important, but what matters is, is this concept that contracts are sacred, AKA protected by the law. Contracts are a legal document, like any other legal document or law, and therefore, as long as it's a legal contract, or, you know, governments decide what that is, state and federal government. And this would be very important for the Industrial Revolution. All of you know, or maybe not even thought about, but you innately know that the entire business system, everything operates on contracts. And all of you have signed a contract. Most of you probably signed a lot of contracts. You probably don't even know you're doing it. If you have a Gmail account, you assigned, you signed a contract. Or if you're on the Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it might be, you sign the contract. Or you go through Microsoft and Teams, you check a box, that's a contract. You've all signed contracts. And this is really important for this reason. Now, first off, we understand this concept, contracts are legal documents. But here's the big, this is why it's so important. Contracts are done by two entities, A and B two people, two businesses, you know, whatever it might be, get A and B, two. So when you sign up for the, for the, into the Google to get a Gmail account, you have you and the Google. Now, which one, you or the Google, has more power? Me. Yeah, you do, obviously. You can, no, who has more power? By far, who writes the contract? In fact, they write it and you be accepted your lack of power that all of you who have a Gmail account or any other account check the box. You didn't even read it, did you? You didn't even read it. You you could be, and you did in many ways. You read it? You did? I know you did. <laughs> uh, okay, so, but here's the point. We just so accept that power imbalance that we just check off because we know we have no choice. Whoever has the power writes the contract. Therefore, I, by definition, contracts favor whom? The powerful. Now, wait a sec. If governments guarantee contracts and contracts are written for and favoring the powerful, 
who does government favor? And that's what we have to get down. This, everyone got it. You have to get this down. Dartmouth versus Woodward ingrained, set the precedent that the federal government is behind the power. Every time you sign a contract to write a contract, the government is saying, the government is guaranteeing that contract and you are giving away a lot of your life. If you would read the Google contract, you would find out that you're giving away everything. Every ounce of privacy you have, you've just given away to somebody else who will sell it and try to make money off of you and sell it to other people, give it to governments. Yeah. Same thing if you get an Amazon or anything else. And boy, will you find that out if you get, let's say, a credit card. Wow, will you find out what power is. And it won't be in your hands. Now, that's not necessarily good or bad. That's not the point. The point is, government's on the side of the power. And remember Federalist Hamiltonian economics. The central government will be used by the powerful to put money in their hands with the stated goal of building factories and industry. But it could also be to build you know, gold gilded carriages so they could ride around throwing pennies to the urchins. Next, McCulloch versus Maryland. That would say it was about a national bank, but it confirmed this idea that government has implied powers. It has implied powers. Now, I know it says in the constitution, but it's basically saying the national bank is an implied power. They can do it, and therefore, there could be more powers. And that fits in directly with Gibbons versus Ogden. And that one was uh, four year, five years later. This was about a steamboat um, going between, uh, going on a river uh, over state line. And it said government can regulate interstate commerce. That's interstate commerce. They can set the regulations for a steamboat crossing state lines. And so, it's in the Constitution, but it made it very clear. They have these powers. But once again, this is a gray area because of that elastic clause, that necessary and proper. So this is an issue to this day. But every single one, every single one, from Marbury versus Madison to Gibbons versus Ogden, put more power into the hands of the national government. And you can imagine how those early Republicans are terrified because they see if the large central government leads to monopoly and accumulation of wealth. It doesn't quite work that way, but that's what they believe. These are your five cases we have to know. Barber versus Madison, Gibbons versus Ogden, McCulloch versus Maryland, Dartmouth versus Woodward, and Fletcher versus Peck. Five of them. 20, 1824. And the thing about that is, I would just simply ask, it'd be a really simple question, it'd be matching, and it'll be federal government can regulate interstate commerce. And then Fletcher versus Peck. Some, that'll be, your choices will be the, Sound good? That's all it will be. I, I'm not, and I don't expect you to have immediate recall. That's not the point. The point is I want you to think about it so when you go back and review it, it's there. Somewhere in the deep, dark, and sometimes terrifying recesses of your mind. One more, a couple more things. In 1818, the U.S. and Britain came together in what's called the, the Convention of 1800. It's a treaty, but it's called the Convention of 18. That's 1800, 1818. And <coughs> I think this is supposed to be the last bit of snow. Who here was surprised when they woke up in the morning expecting to see maybe an inch and they found five inches? Wasn't that quite a shock? I've got a quick shovel and turn into much more. All right, so what it did is this. It established a permanent U.S. border. They just said, simply put, you know what latitude line this is? Or latitude line this is? That's, that's, that's Korea. <laughs> the 49. The 49. It's sometimes it's called the 49th parallel, so latitude lines are parallel. It goes till the continental divide. And it sets some issues for the Great Lakes and a few other things. But it showed that Britain and the United States were actually much closer than anybody acknowledged that just four years earlier they were fighting a war. And over the next 50 years, the United States and Britain will have commercial relationships that will draw the two together. 
So that's the convention of 1818. The next year, 1819, the Adams Onus Treaty with Spain. And the United States had there's some border issues, but the big thing was Florida. And Florida enslaved people who run away to freedom. Because this might shock you. Slaves don't like slavery. But they were called fugitives. That's just the term they use. So you hear the term, or you see the term fugitive in this era, that means a, a, a enslaved person who ran away. They were running to Florida because Florida was swamps, they could hide. Many of them joined a brand new tribe called the Seminoles, which was a hodgepodge of different tribes that tribes that have been destroyed by disease, and they eagerly welcomed more people in, especially runaway slaves. And the U.S. wanted to end that safety valve. Slaveholders were furious about this. Their property is running away. Their property should stand and take it till they die. So they got the United States purchased Florida and also established the border right here between New Spain and Mexico. I'm sorry, New, New Spain and the U.S. It was unclear. This became clear. And why do I have that map? Oh, Manchurian candidate. I was talking about that. And New Spain, which will very soon be Mexico. Ironically, Spain is in real trouble. Spain is about ready to go through a series of revolutions. The once powerful Spain is, well, let's put it this way, all of Latin America is about to be independent. Just about all. One more thing. Henry Clay, right here. One of those war hawks, Henry Clay. He would propose a series of bills that for the next 40 years will dominate American politics. He called it the American system. Now think about this as nationalism will strengthen the United States. And he is taking the tact of Hamilton. And he was a Republican. He would soon be the leader of the brand new Whig party. He'd be Mr. Whig. The American system, the American system. And the, it's a series of three laws that he dubbed the American system. This nationalist program, the first one, a protective tariff. And that happened. But this is going to be a conflict all the way through. By the way, you know, as I said, about 40 years up until Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln loved Henry Clay. Lincoln, when he was a very young man, became a Whig because of Henry Clay. Two, a strong bank. The bank was rechartered, but he wanted a bank of the United States. And here's the biggie. Remember that I mentioned the transportation revolution? He wanted government aid for transport. This is ports, canals. And in the era, at the time, they called that internal improvements. Internal improvements were like roads, canals, harbors. That's internal improvements. For example, during the Jefferson administration, they built what's called the National Road. Oh, and that's why I put down railroads up. The National Road, if you look, everyone look over here real quick. We're going to cross Ohio, Illinois. It was still a federal territory built on federal government expense. And this was revolutionary. All roads today are built on federal government. Massive government aid for everybody, good or bad, but yeah. This is going to be debated time after time. The American system, the American system. And these are laws that want to be passed. But how do laws become laws? I mean, that's a really good question. I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but I don't understand. Somebody explain this to me. Would it be great? Would it be great if we could watch something that might explain that? Yeah. So I've been promising this, right? So another blast from my young adulthood, early 1970s. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 
Why didn't it play? Hear it okay? Louder. We're done. This is kind of a win. This is By the way, that law box, that was a built law. That was packed. Same in the state. It's committee to whatever chamber it starts with. That's just the way it kind of happens. Ideal. We see. Yeah, it's. That's it. Stop. Are you sound? I love it. Yeah, that, that deserves an applause. By the way, the same guy did Conjunction Junction did this. Saturday Night Live actually did a, a more realistic one, which I can't show you for a couple reasons. But it's uh, it, it's uh, they do the same exact thing with a bill and talking about lobbyists and who actually writes bills and it's actually pretty clever. But you must get parental approval to watch it. Did everyone ca did everyone hear that? Did everyone hear what I just said? Okay, good. Oh, by the way, the school bus thing? Yes. So school bus must stop. That is a law that was passed in the 1970s. They must stop at railroad crossings. They cannot just cross. They have to stop and look both ways. Now, wait a second. Why can Congress pass a law that school bus drivers in Montana must stop at railroad crossings? The elastic clause and what power? Which enumerated power? Trains. What do they do? What do we call trade that crosses over state lines? Interstate commerce. It's interstate commerce. You can do almost anything in interstate commerce and regulate. So with that. So in 1823, one more thing about that. It's called the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine, now this is not a law. It's a statement of the president's foreign policy position. There'll be a few doctrines. We'll, have to, we'll get the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. We'll get the other doctrine we really need to know. It's the most important one to our point of view. It's going to be called the Truman Doctrine. Now we arrive to World War II. We talked about that in special topics, Vietnam. And so this is not law, but it's a statement of presidential policy, and they act like this is what the United States will do. 
Well, there were revolutions all across Latin America. 1819, 1821, from Mexico down to Argentina, all revolted against Spanish and Portuguese rule. And by 1821, they all won their independence, including a massive Mexico. All the Central American countries, between Mexico and Colombia, all created one, they created one big country. It lasted about 15 years, and there were just too many differences. But that is why, to this day, every flag from Guatemala down to Panama has blue in their flag to remember that attempt at one place. Didn't quite work. <coughs> Weak republics were created, and all the way down. Well, the United States and Britain didn't want countries like France going over and trying to conquer and make them called French colonies. They wanted weak republics that they could economically exploit. We'll get to that. We're, co we're, coming, we're coming to bananas. Well, Britain, did, Britain said it, but it said no European interference in the Western Hemisphere. So besides colonies are already there, new ones can't just create themselves. So for example, France can't come over and break Mexico. Why do I say that? Because France is going to try in the 1850s and 60s. But they can't do it. That, at least that's with the United States. But the U.S. can't stop anybody from doing it. Ironically, less than a decade after the War of 1812, it would be Britain that would enforce this. I like this creepy picture of Monroe in the globe. I just had to use it. Britain would enforce it because Britain didn't want France or Austria or anyone else creating colonies. Now, in reality, this no one talked about the Monroe. Doctrine. By 1860, it was a, it was a, a speech everyone forgot. But going into the 20th century. The United States would be powerful. They want to go over and economically exploit or even take over parts of Latin America. And so they literally dusted it off with a caveat, this is our hemisphere. And that's why you get this cartoon from the early 1900s with Uncle Sam now straddling the whole continent and informing everybody this is all. And Teddy Roosevelt will call this big stick diplomacy, the big sticks to Mondo Dawn. So it all of a sudden, they brought it out again. So that's why we have to know that. Now, the thing is, we mentioned these few political things, some things we had to get to. The whole world was changing, and that would be personified by something that really had never happened in this form. There have been panics, but the panic of 1819 was a shocking event. Shocking. There was growing something called an asset bubble. People were buying assets, hoping the value would go up. Taking advantage of this new changing economy, especially land. Remember, everyone's buying land. But also other things they're buying. What do you call it when you buy something cheap and you want to make money off of it? What well, is an investment? But the big thing, that's speculation. That's speculation. There are all these speculators, land speculators, but also what's government debt called? Bonds. There's bond speculators. There's lots of bond speculators now. And also something new called a stock, which is a little piece of a what? A company. These are brand new. People are expecting the economy to boom. Well, the economy really wasn't booming in 1819. This was all brand new. And people were overpaying. When there's great demand for land, what happens to the price? And sometimes, if there's an asset bubble, the price will get will grow that people are buying that will actually be greater than the value of the land. It's called a bubble. There's nothing underneath it. And what happens when people realize all of a sudden we're overpaying for land? The bubble pops and prices tumble. So let's say you had a piece on borrowing this, a piece of paper that said, you owe stocks or bonds or land that's worth a lot of money. And all of a sudden the price drops by 70% or 80% or 100%. And you look at your piece of paper and now it's worthless. How do you feel? Panicked. And that's where the term comes from. When the bubble bursts, there's panic. Has a panic happened in your lifetime? A massive one. The second biggest in history happened in your lifetime, 2007, 2008. The second biggest in history. What's the biggest in history? 
1929 through 1932, yeah. So, this was what we call a panic is a financial panic. The problem is this. The problem is this. The problem with the financial panic is this. The entire economy was changing. And before, panics didn't affect everybody. This panic affected people all over. Because more people than ever before are working for something called a wage. And this was the first time this was a shock. Not that many, but enough. And the next panic, the big panic, will be 20 years later, and it will devastate the country. The next panic after that, 20 years later, will be will help lead to the Civil War. The next panic after that in 1876, or 1873, will lead to revolution in 1877. And so, called the Great Upheaval. These are affecting more and more people than ever before. Why? The Industrial Revolution, which will change everything. If you don't believe me, look at that wheel. Just look at it. Look at that wheel. You don't see stuff like that today. Now, I like this wheel because I had some poor worker. They said, sit there. We want to get the size of the wheel. So he just. But you notice we have a photograph. Everything changed because of the Industrial Revolution. If they would have thrown any of us, well, you guys, me, I'm from a tougher part of your generation, but you guys, into, let's say, 1800, you would look around the world and you would cry. You would roll up in the fetal position and just go, yeah, because the world would make no sense. In 1830, or 1840 especially, the world would start making sense. It would make sense to us. It's kind of our world. You throw us into 1900, it's our world. Everything changed in that 100 years. And the convulsions of this so-called, oh, I call it the American system, will change us all forever. Nothing before or since is compared. I think the closest we could get to would be, the two things I, could, I can conceive of would be fire and the plow. That's about it. This changed everything. So let's go through a couple things. First off, before this, before the Industrial Revolution and the economic system that's created called capitalism, boy, with capitalism, that would quite, cause quite a shock in areas that hadn't gone through the Industrial Revolution. It was cottage industry. I mean, industry manufacturing like this, we, these weavers here were done in people's homes or their own little personalized shops. Skilled craftsmen like these Coopers, they did they did the hardest, or they did the most specialized work, and they were paid on how skillful they were. How skillful were they? That's not the way it is today. And people were relatively self-sufficient. You couldn't really rely upon goods. You might be able to buy some and sell some, but you had to kind of make things yourself. That was the world. It's all going to change overnight. Now, I want to be clear about it. It's not like all of a sudden there went from cottage industry to no cottage industry. But once factories started, it just the, the steamroller would be coming. And actually, it's going to be really scary. Even if your world hasn't changed, you can see the change coming at you. And it's going to change everything you think you are. What was that religious change that happened in the 1830s and 1840s that we allowed to do from chapter 11? The what? The Second Great Awakening. It's no coincidence. That you have the second great awakening. My whole world's changing. I am questioning everything I know. Like my whole belief system. So, what are the factors of industrial growth? What led to this? First off, the Industrial Revolution began in Britain. And so this is a scene looking down the Thames uh, of London Bridge and factories. Here is a version of this with one of my favorite artists, which art would change because of the Industrial Revolution. My favorite type of art is Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. Claude Monet is one of my favorite artists. And this is London Bridge. Flat photos on a screen do not do this picture justice. You don't see the colors, you don't see the textures, but it kind of is trying to show just the dirt and grime with the remnants of the medieval London Bridge, which London Bridge is not in London anymore. 
it's gone. There's no London Bridge in London. Does anybody know where London Bridge is today? London Bridge, no, it did not fall down despite the... They removed it brick by brick after World War II, and it was bought by somebody in Lake Havasu, Arizona, and is in Lake Havasu, Arizona, <laughs> over a canal. It's true, London Bridge is in Lake Havasu, Arizona. If you ever been to Lake Havasu, it really is there. True story. Yeah. Some people have a lot of money. It was it was agricultural. You're taking advantage of U.S. government irrigation programs. Got rich, but, but now you can go visit. It's it's right next to a golf course in a desert. The world is crazy. But number two, speaking of the industrial revolution, that's why we have that kind of stuff. The War of 1812, remember the embargo and the British blockade? There's the Royal Navy at Portsmouth. We couldn't buy the industrial goods from Britain, AKA cloth. And so that it's gonna stimulate the textile industry in the United States. The War of 1812, which in reality, the war itself, besides some good stories, the battles aren't that incredibly important. And it was a status quo antebellum treaty. And yet, after the War of 1812, everything was different. It's kind of one of those amazing things. And then the transportation revolution. Yes, once again, triggered by the Industrial Revolution. So the transportation revolution, uh, I just put a picture of an American locomotive racing a horse. I don't know. But 1800, the world moved at two, two to three miles an hour. Now I know for short distances, you could run or ride a horse, but you're not gonna ship goods. And so this is a map showing how long it took to ship goods from New York. All this area in red, that's one day. That's how far you could go. So it took over a day to get to Philadelphia. It took three days to get to Boston. So everything moved at a snail's pace. Well, let me rephrase it. You didn't know any different. That's just the way the world was. You can see from this test. The world moved that slow, which had to tell you how much of getting on a train must have been just unreal. World changing. I can move this fast and I don't get tired or the horse doesn't get tired. Wow. So it says three weeks here, but it was actually more efficient to ship goods from the new town of Cincinnati down the Ohio, down the Mississippi, and around to New York. So, not, how can you have manufacturing? How are you going to get raw materials to market? It's going to be so expensive. And how do you get your, um, your, the goods you make to people who will buy it? That's why people had to be self-sufficient. Self and if it's spoiled, you can't do it. I mean, your refrigeration for meat was live animals that you have to slaughter that day or they rot it. it what's going to change by the end of the decade? I mean, how people eat, everything will change. And our taste will change dramatically. Tell you about that more later. The first one's going to be roads. Here's the national road I told you about. Now it's a national park. And because the road is still there, it's called the macadamization process, but the road is pretty amazing. You know, people hike on it, they bike on it. They don't, they used to have cars on it until about 1970. They turned into a national park. It's really cool. It's one of those things you might think, oh, it's a road. That's what I thought. You know, I wanted to see it, but I didn't think it'd be as neat as it was. It's really cool. And they have these old inns. You know, people walk on it. You can see it like an old style. They call them taverns, but it's an inn. It's really neat. But that's the National Road. But there were very few roads made. Roads were really expensive, really difficult to build. A few private companies built roads. And private companies, these are called turnpikes, a.k.a. toll roads. And so... One of the first major toll roads is going to be across Pennsylvania. This is Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this is the first, or this is the longest freestanding bridge in the United States. It's on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. It's now part of the National Park. If you're driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike, you can stop and look at it. It's really cool. That's another one I'm driving down. Interstate 80 is a toll road across Pennsylvania. And a by Conestoga Wagon, but here's the thing about toll roads. Toll roads, therefore, the private company needs money. So where do toll roads go? What places do toll roads connect? If you you got to make money off of it. 
cities. You have big cities. They're not going to go to small cities. Why would you go to a small city? There's no money. Private roads only go to small places. That's why, this is what you have to get down. The roads only went to the big cities. Most people would not be serviced by roads. Road building was always very, very And you see that with all the way through um, railroads, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be an issue. Why do you think planes go to Helena? First off, the federal government built an airport. And secondly, no air, no, no, no airline will go to Helena. They are massively subsidized, aka the federal government through taxpayer money gives the airlines a bunch of money so they go to little places like Helena and still overcharge because there's no restrictions. They would never go to Helena. They wouldn't make money. In fact, only very recently would there be an airport that they'd actually make money out of, and that's this, this phenomenon of Bozeman over the last five or six years. And Bozeman used to be this little cow town, and now it's not. <laughs> and yeah, same thing with electricity. They would never go to small towns unless the federal government did it. There'd be no Montana if there wasn't a federal government. Well, there'd be land here, but there'd be no people. Well, in the years before the Civil War, up to 1850, there were 10,000 miles of roads. How they measure the cost of transport goods is a ton of, how much it costs to transport a ton of goods a mile. And in 1850, it cost about 15 cents a ton mile, and we consider that a drop of about 50%. So that means transportation costs drop, but it's still, roads are more expensive than other forms of transportation. The next one is canal. And canals are gonna be through state aid. Canals are much cheaper. There'll be 3,700 miles of canal. Canals are a lot, also, a lot uh, harder to dig, but it went down to 0 0.1 or dropped by uh, two thirds, a penny a mile. That's a lot cheaper than road. Water transportation is a lot cheaper. For the obvious reasons are you can't get too big of a, a wagon or truck today because it would destroy the road or the bridges. Water is buoyancy. Or, so that's why you get these bigger and bigger um, container ships of today, even though the super container ships are actually really inefficient. But these are some of the canals. The CNO, uh, the B, yeah, the CNO, um, this it has here, it's called, it's, it says it's the Pennsylvania Canal, that's going to be soon known as the b &O. and Erie Canal. Eventually, they're going to have canals by 1830 that you go from New York up to Hudson, cross the canal, cross Lake Erie, down to here, eventually connect to Chicago. They'll connect the Ohio by water. That will change everything. And this is a lot of state aid. The most famous canal is the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal, which will be this massive system from Albany to Buffalo. And that's why there's a Buffalo. That's why there's Buffalo, New York. It's the Erie Canal. Today it's a national park. And people I know will take cruises on it. I know people take cruises on these long boats. It's, it's kind of cool in the canals of France, too. But it would be finished, began in 1817, took eight years to build. And the canal would be like this. By definition, they have to be flat. On the sides, they have, they'd have mules pulling the flat or the keel boats down. So you can see how that worked. That's the way canals work. The CNO Canal is not used anymore, but it's now the National Park Service runs it, and it's the most popular hiking destination in the United States because it's flat through the beautiful Appalachian Mountains there. That's another one. If you get a chance, go. It's really cool. But let me show you one more thing with this picture before you leave. You see it? Look at this pig! That thing is massive, and it's got these weird, nasty knees. That is a terrifying pig. What does the reading do? Yeah. I was going to give it earlier and I just got busy, I know. 
So you get the golden opportunity to fill out real quick, and then I'll sign it. So just put down classroom. Yes, you put up I have I know. I know. Goodbye, everybody. I have to go pick up a couple dads. I will put it in tomorrow for school. Right? Good, it tomorrow. I know it's a pain, but. Oh, thank you. Who's your study hall teacher? Okay. Oh, well, I, I know. We had the same thing, and I didn't write you a pass when I should have. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's like, you stop. Yeah, that's what I mean. I gotta get it down. I don't know. I don't know. Because what's the point? Is it? Ah! How many are you doing? Yeah. Oh. I don't know if that's good. Yeah, so two of us are strong. And we'll start. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. Why is there a great one? I understand. Not that far, but she said that she's not. Are you guys going to bite? Yep. Yeah, just yeah. right yeah. up on the rug. <laughs> on, on the rug! On the rug! On the rug! rug. What's that? No, no, no. no, this is science. It's got to be in the middle of Can this tile. And the middle of that. <coughs> Why don't we? It's, there, 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 there. Okay. Okay. Now does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> You gotta do it right now. It's getting done. Yeah, we'll do it right now. A sheet of paper. How would you like to grade Cass? Experience? How's he have experience? I'm older than that. I have experience. I'm quicker. 
I have the what? Yeah, I know. A wee bit chilly out there. All right, everyone, let's go take out your notes and talk a little bit about the Industrial Revolution. No, you got to wait. Every day we No, I didn't buy it. I didn't I didn't I I I did assign a read assignment for, for for Friday, but I'm gonna actually we're gonna do it. It's due today. Clear your desk. No, no, it's due. I might give you a couple more pages, but it's due on Monday. We have all these makeups. Oh, I got most of all the joints graded. Or I'm sorry, all the matching graded. Why am I saying matching? Let me start over. Act like I never said a word. Everybody. Quiet now. I got all the short IDs, IDs graded, or almost all. And people are doing very well in this class. Uh, except, no, I can't remember exactly what you got. But, you know, I'm always going to find little things here and there, but people are doing very well. So hopefully, tomorrow. Hopefully. We can have a lot of makeup, you know. <laughs> It's not Friday. Oh, and it was supposed to quit snowing, but I talked to the I talked to my people, and they said we'll have snow for the rest of the month. I knew it. I'm so hungry. It's me. Number one in twenty-five in the market. Okay, everybody, write down the American system. The American system. All right, somebody said my name. Last question. Yeah. I just want to say, like, if they all buy an industrial, an industrial what? An industrial. Wow, you're an idea guy. I know. And it's I'm a little scared now. We should make that hell in a slot. All right, right. Let's get started, everybody. And we are gonna watch a video today, and maybe one tomorrow, a little video clip.